Grand Canyon is perhaps chief among Western landscapes that no number of photographs or films can prepare you to experience. Standing on the rim, looking across its impossibly wide expanse, or standing at the river looking up, every perspective you take is overwhelming. Welcome to Writing Westward. I'm your host, Brendan Rensing. I've run in the Grand Canyon a few times, where my only concern was putting one foot in front of the other, and even that was a challenge, to not trip as I constantly gawked at the scenery. I cannot imagine trying to balance actual tasks and work in such a setting. Well, the first two women to successfully raft the Grand Canyon did just that, as they did it as scientists, botanists, collecting samples and recording detailed observations throughout their perilous 1938 journey. This month, we speak with science journalist Melissa L. Sivigny, who details their story in her new book, Brave the Wild River, the untold story of two women who mapped the botany of the Grand Canyon. Thanks for listening. For new listeners, allow me to take a moment to explain a bit about writing westward and myself. Each episode features a conversation with people writing about the North American West. Historians, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, sociologists, and others. By showcasing their work, I hope to spark your curiosity to think more deeply about the region, its lands and environments, and the histories and experiences of the peoples who call it home. If a writer or topic intrigues you, you can find links to their work in the show notes or at writingwestward.org. And if you have a moment, please do subscribe, share links with friends, leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using to listen, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and send in some feedback. Writing Westward is supported by the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University, where I, Brendan Rensink, serve as Associate Director and an Associate Professor of History. For better or worse, this is a one-man operation with me playing role of host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, and everything else, all tasks for which I have no training. But I am passionate about the North American West, so this difficult work is well worth the excuse to read more books and talk to interesting people. At the end of each episode, I'll include a little bit more information about me and my scholarship and about the Red Center, our public programming and projects, and funding opportunities that you could apply for. With that, let me introduce a little bit more about today's guest and why we're talking to them. Melissa L. Sivigny is a science journalist at the Arizona Public Radio Station, KNAU in Flagstaff. Her writing intersects science, nature, and history, with a focus on the American Southwest. She earned a BS in environmental science and policy from the University of Arizona, and an MFA in creative writing and environment from Iowa State University. In 2016, she published two books, Under Desert Skies, How Tucson Mapped the Way to the Moon and Planets, published by the University of Arizona Press, and Mythical River, Chasing the Mirage of New Water in the American Southwest, published by the University of Iowa Press. The latter of the two was honored with multiple awards. Her shorter form writings and journalism have also received awards and honors. In her new book, Brave the Wild River, the untold story of two women who mapped the botany of the Grand Canyon, published by W.W. W. Norton in 2023, Sevigny relates the story of two remarkable scientists who took part in a successful rafting expedition through the Grand Canyon to study its botany. Their pioneering botanical discoveries were historic, but the media at the time focused primarily on a different historic aspect of their trip. They were the first two women to successfully raft the oft-treacherous waters. Sevigny's clear and evocative prose not only tell their story in all of its drama and excitement, but offers important contemplations on the gendered worlds of early 20th century science and outdoor adventuring. It serves as an important reminder of how we distort history when we reduced historic figures down to single aspects of their identity, in this case gender, and thus overshadow their other potential accomplishments, in this case science. In Sevigny's work, she successfully recovers the stories of Alzada Clover and Lois Jodder, as the groundbreaking and daring scientists that they were. It is an inspiring tale, but Sevigny's telling should cause us to pause and carefully consider how we view and represent Western figures, both in the past and present. Melissa L. Sevigny, welcome to Writing Westward. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about your book, uh, to uh, kind of learn with our listeners about 
Uh, these remarkable two scientists, two women that you've written this book about, Lois Jodder and Elzada Clover. That's right. Yeah. Um, these were University of Michigan botanists. One was uh, a professor, one was her student, and they took part in 1938 in this expedition to raft down the Colorado River, which I think to some people today may not sound as extraordinary as it actually was. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you happened upon this story and what compelled you to spend, I don't know how many years, uh, researching and writing a book on them? Sure. Yeah. It's uh, it's coming up on five years now since I first kind of stumbled across this story. Um, I was looking for something entirely different kind of online um, in the special collections of Northern Arizona University, which is here in Flagstaff where I live. Um, I don't even remember what I was searching for, but this hyperlink came up on the, the little side window, you know, like sometimes they populate those hyperlinks and it said women botanists. And I was like, huh, let's, I was curious. So I clicked on it and there was just one name in there and the name was Lois Jotter. And it turned out her collection of papers is archived at Northern Arizona University. And, you know, I read the little description and I learned that she had gone down the Colorado River through Grand Canyon in 1938 um, with her mentor, Elzada Clover, and that they were both botanists, and they made the first kind of formal collection of plants in the region. And I was just astonished that I had never heard of either of them before. You know, I thought I was pretty up to date. You know, I grew up in Arizona, and I thought I knew a lot about Colorado River history, and I had never encountered their names. And so I started fishing around trying to learn more about them. I found a few little things. There were some articles and some book chapters but nothing that really satisfied my curiosity, specifically about the science they did. I, mean, I thought that was extraordinary that they had made this plant collection. And eventually I came to the conclusion that if I wanted to really know the story, I was going to have to write it myself. Now, you're a journalist and a science writer. Um, what was kind of your writing? Because writing a book is it's a thing. <laughs> um, yes. What was your experience kind of writing more long form stuff like this before? Yeah, this is my third book. Um, it was It's quite a different experience. My my first two were with university presses, um, which are fantastic resources in the world, you know, to publish work that otherwise might not find its way out into the world. So I, I really appreciated those, those experiences. I learned a lot. But this book felt a little different to me. I was it was almost a compulsion. Like I couldn't sleep at night thinking about this story. Like I really, really looked forward to getting up on Saturdays. I write on Saturdays because I have a full-time job and and I just wanted to to dive into this story. It was very uh, kind of obsess obsessive for me <laughs> for several years. Uh, I wrote it first as an article, a long form article um, that was published a about a year after I first discovered the story and I could tell, even though the article was quite long, it was published at this wonderful magazine called The Atavis, which does long pieces. Um, I could tell I wasn't done with it. I, I could tell I still had so much more to say. Um, so I, after the article came out, um, I found an agent and I, I uh, you know, worked with the agent on a book proposal. And then that got um, picked up by Norton, which is like my dream press. So it was really wonderful. Yeah, this will ensure it gets a, a pretty wide readership um, with a trade press of that stature. Um, let's maybe set the stage for listeners about um, what's really unique about uh, the story of um, Elzada and Lois. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the, uh, well, a few different issues, and this might take us a while to get through, but um, kind of in, I mean, people who visit the Grand Canyon today may take for granted really um, how recent our knowledge about it is in, in terms of at least non-native peoples. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't, it was not, you know, fully explored uh, until more recent than people would think. So maybe what is the state of Grand Canyon scientific knowledge in 1938? And um, even specifically uh, with, with botany. And then I'd like you to talk maybe a little bit about the unique, the kind of the gendered uniqueness of women in these spaces, be it science spaces, as these women were botanists, but also kind of the adventuring, outdoor adventuring space of, of river running. Yeah, right. That <laughs> That's a lot. This is why I wrote a 300 page book, because <laughs> it takes a while to explore these these issues. Um, 
Yeah. So the state of knowledge in 1938, you know, as you said, indigenous people have been in this region for forever and um, have very, very intimate knowledge of the ecology and the plant life there. And uh, there's wonderful stories from the Navajo and the Hopi of actually running through the Grand Canyon in, in various, you know, forms of boats, um, which were really wonderful for me to to hear. So, so there's that long history. Um, but in really, even up to today, we haven't really acknowledged that history. And so in 1938, people like Elzada and Lois, who were both white women, didn't didn't know much about that. Um, they knew that indigenous people lived in the region, but they didn't necessarily know that they had this intimate knowledge of the, the river ecosystem. So they're coming at it from the perspective of Western trained botanists, and they know nothing. I mean, they really know nothing. There's been nothing published about the plant life along the river corridor. They started up at the, the Green River, Green River, Utah, went through Cataract Canyon, Glen Canyon, which is now underneath Lake Powell, but wasn't at the time, and then the Grand Canyon. And they ended at Lake Mead, which was just starting to fill. They had just finished Hoover Dam. So this this whole corridor, I mean, there was this whole corridor, there was really nothing published about the plant life or the ecology. And it was really fascinating to read their papers and their notes. They took extensive notes as they were going down the river and kind of see how they were puzzling things out. You're talking about a time where the word ecosystem isn't in widespread use. It's it's just been invented a couple of years before, but nobody's using it yet. So even without the vocabulary we have today, you could see them trying to understand the ecosystem, trying to understand why these plants and not other plants. How are they adapting to this incredibly harsh environment with droughts and floods and hot temperatures? You know, how do they interact with the the animals of the region? Um, it was really interesting to see them unfolding those questions in their notes. Could you tell from their journals, do they have expectations for what they might find or how it might be different than say what is more familiar up along the canyon rims and, and you know, in the surrounding mesas what were they right. thinking they were going to see yeah it's yeah that's interesting i think they did have some ideas but you could tell from um like the grant application that elzada applied for before she went they were paying for this trip out of their own pockets right <laughs> so um they didn't really have university support but she applied for a small grant and you could tell in the language that she was really like positioning this as like it could be anything. We do not know what we're going to find at the the you know the bottom of this series of very deep canyons. But she did have some ideas. She had spent a lot of time driving around in this region, and she had some questions. She wanted to know, um, you know, it, the Grand Canyon lays at the intersection of three different deserts, and she wanted to know how those deserts were kind of meeting and mingling, and whether the plants migrated up and down the river corridor. So she had some ideas that she kind of wanted to test. Um, but you could tell that she. She was excited by the idea that she didn't really know what she was going to find. Uh, and what's the state of river running in 1938? Well, it's almost non-existent. Um, so, you know, John Wesley Powell went down the river in uh, 1869. And but he made it with only one arm. So, right. Yeah. Like, how so hard could it be? It couldn't be too bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, he wanted to do science, but um, on that first trip, at least, not a lot of science was done. It was very much what what he called, he described it as a race for a dinner, right? <laughs> like trying to get out and get some food. Um, so that must have been a pretty alarming account for El Zeta and Lois to read as, as an example of what they were getting into. After Powell, there were about a, a dozen expeditions before 1938, um, all men. Um, not entirely all white men. There were a few black men on one of those expeditions, but almost all white men. And uh, those expeditions were not scientific expeditions. Uh, they were expeditions. Um, some of them were for fun, but others were were like um, others were uh, surveys for dams or for a railroad, you know, ways people were looking at ways that they could kind of harness this region or exploit this region. So Alzada and Lois are doing something quite different in their kind of scientific curiosity about the trip. But, you know, that's a span of 70 years where you've had a dozen expeditions go down the river. There's no one, they can't just like sign up. There's no one to call and say, take me down the river, right? Nobody is doing commercial river running trips. And the um, the person who who kind of leads this expedition off, Norm Nevels, his dream is to actually start that process. He wants to start commercial running, uh, commercial river running trips through the Grand Canyon. Because so he has a he, business out of a Mexican hat on the San Juan River. Right, right, right. And it's not, I would, it, calling it a business is almost a stretch at this point, right? Okay. Like he's taken a couple of trips down the San Juan River, which in comparison is a nice, calm river, you know, <laughs> 
Um, and so he's got this idea, but it's not fully realized. So they actually, they build the boats, right? Wooden boats. They build them from scratch. Um, they kind of make up a menu and they put together these bags of canned food, almost all canned food, <laughs> nothing nice and fresh. You know, they don't have an emergency radio. They don't have really waterproof containers. They don't have sleeping bags. You know, all the stuff that today we would take for granted on a trip like this. Uh, so they're really really not a whole lot of idea of what they're getting into. There was um, one other woman we know of who had ventured into the Grand Canyon. You said that the expeditions were all men. Mm -hmm. um, there was one, I guess it wasn't really an expedition, but um, the Hides, who in the late 20s, I think it was. 1928. Yeah. And I should have said all of the successful expeditions yeah. for men <laughs> because there was, in fact, um, Bessie and Glenn Hyde. Which is it's sort of unfortunate we think of that as a failed expedition because they made it almost all the way right through the Grand Canyon on this very difficult trip. Just the two of them in this big bulky boat. It was their, their honeymoon, honeymoon, their yeah. honeymoon trip, right? <laughs> and that story of Bessie and Glenn Hyde, who who disappeared, um, you know, their bodies were never found to this day. We don't really know what happened to them. Um that story was in the newspapers a lot, and when Elzada and Lois made their plans public, everyone went straight to Bessie Hyde. Everyone told them, but what about Bessie Hyde? And they would say things like, women can't do this. Women can't run this river. You can tell that's a little nonsensical because, of course, Glenn also disappeared on the same trip. Yeah. But there was a big fixation on this, you know, this honeymoon bride who disappeared and that sort of haunted them on this journey. You know, they were really trying to convince people that they were doing a serious scientific survey, and nobody was interested in that. All of the journalists wanted to talk to them about Bessie Hyde and about the fact that no woman, you know, of course, they don't know this long history of indigenous river runners, but the newspapers would say no woman has ever succeeded at doing this trip. Yeah, and this is the kind of the tension we see, and I don't know if you felt this in writing the book that, you know, we, we want to celebrate this unique kind of, kind of gendered accomplishment that these women, hey, we we can do this too. But then at some point, their gender becomes all the people talk about, right. overshadowing that they were scientists and they actually ac accomplished things as scientists. Right. Yeah, I definitely feel that tension. And I think Elzada and Lois did too. You know, they wanted people to remember them as botanists, not as women. And that's not really what has happened. People who do know their story think of them as the first non-Native women to run the river. And it's, you know, it's hard for me to avoid that, that, you know, that fact <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> they were doing something pretty unusual for their gender. Um, but I know it's not how they really wanted to be remembered. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's maybe kind of walk quickly or float I don't know what analogy we should use here kind of through their their trip and then at the end of our discussion I have some kind of big picture uh questions that I want to ask um, after we kind of lay out at least some of the chronology of their experience um, sure uh, so they start at Green River um Neville's instead of he could have taken them down the San Juan um but he had some interest in also maybe developing business on the green right mm -hmm. so um they start on the green. There's a group of six of them in three boats. That's right. Six people, three boats. I still have no idea why they started where they did, um, because it meant they'd had to they had to go through Cataract Canyon, which at, at the time, I think people f were more fearful of Cataract Canyon than they were of the Grand Canyon. Um, yeah, and like I, the graveyard of the Colorado. The graveyard right. of the Colorado. Right? There were horror stories about Cataract Canyon. Um, and so I have no idea why he decided to start where he did and not, you know, hit hit it lower down in, in Glen Canyon. Uh, there's no record of why they chose that route, but it's quite a curious choice. And it makes for a rough kind of first. These are all mostly uh, very little experience amongst the group of river running. And so to test out with Cataract Canyon kind of in the first stretch of the trip, you know, above Lee's Ferry is... It's trial Old. by fire. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, I mean, for those who don't know, Cataract Canyon, it's about 41 miles long, 62 sets of major rapids. And uh, if the river's running high, mm -hmm. there's not many calm sections. It's just kind of nonstop. Um, right. How does yeah, it go and, for them? Well, they did hit it a very high water. They they chose to leave kind of right at the end of the snow melt and the beginning of the monsoon, like the worst possible time. I assume they had to do that because, you know, Elzada and Lois taught classes. And so they were, they had to go in the summer. That would be my guess. 
Um, or maybe they didn't know that it was a terrible time to go, but they, they hit Cataract Canyon at very, very high water and everything from the beginning <laughs> goes terribly wrong. <laughs> so at one point they have a boat, you know, pull away from its mooring and, and go off down the river by itself. And this is pretty catastrophic. You have to remember they've got three boats. They've split up their food supplies between these boats. So if they lose a boat, they're going to be in pretty serious trouble. You know, there's there's no way to resupply until they get to Lee's Ferry. So they chase it. Lois and her, one of the boatmen, um, get into another boat and chase it down. And it's a big dramatic chasing to like locate this boat and and get it back. And that's that's their first day on the Colorado River. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't bode well. It does not. Um, I mean, and this is this is repeated. There's other times where the boats get separated, um, where you know they fall in the water. All the things you might expect. Um, there are a number of times which uh, I wasn't expecting where they see the rapids and uh, Neville's decides to line tow. Oh, what's right. the phrase? Line the boats. Yeah. So they they put lines on either side of the boats and they walk along the shore, kind of dragging the boats behind them, which sounds easier than it is. I mean, if you've seen pictures of the shoreline of any of these areas, like there isn't really a shoreline. There's just like rubble and boulders. And so this was backbreaking work and uh yeah nevels was doing that out of caution right he, he kind of he lost some confidence in those early days and and felt he better take the cautious route but it was a huge frustration early in the trip with the whole crew because it slowed them down so much and it was terrible backbreaking work yeah and on this first stretch it slows them down to the point where the general public and some reporters you know are waiting at least ferry uh to get the story and they're multiple days late and People are, uh, you know, kind of assuming the worst, maybe even assuming what they had guessed was going to happen, right? Very much that. I think there was a, an expectation that this trip was going to go badly and kind of a, among the press, I got the sense kind of a an excitement about that, right? Like Kind of like a morbid curiosity <laughs> a, a in a way. More, a morbid curiosity and, you know, kind of a sense that this was going to make a really good story if this expedition just completely wrecked on the river. And so there was a lot of talk about the, you know, the floodwaters being very high and how the boats had probably wrecked and how they were standing at least very watching to see the maybe the wreckage would come floating by and then they would know what had happened, you know. And you can imagine like the, the folks back home, the family members of, of you know, these expedition members just reading all of this in absolute horror. A lot of it was exaggerated, but there was that core of, you know, doubt, that core of like, they've, they've gone off. We have no way to contact them. We, we don't really know what they're getting into. Maybe something bad has happened, you know? Yeah. I mean, for people who haven't been down to these areas, you know, these aren't canyons that if, let's say, your boat wrecks, you're like, well, I guess we'll just hike out of the canyon. Right. right. It, it's it's you know sheer walls. There's often not uh, easy access points in and out. I mean, actually, like a few years later, um, uh, Georgie White, another who later went on, uh, this woman who went on to run a really large uh, kind of a rafting company in the Grand Canyon. Her and a guy um, decided to test the theory that if your boat got you know flipped or got wrecked that you could just float down the grand canyon i think this is in 1950 or so i and remember they, that story and, and they do it they float 60 miles um in life jackets oh my god! it gosh. takes them three days and they just swim their way through the grand canyon anyway i digress that sounds um, terrible <laughs> <laughs> um t tell us about there's this great moment where they're coming down they haven't made the least ferry yet and they see a search plane and right. the search plane throws out a whole bunch, like some like pamphlets or something. <laughs> right. And tell them what, what the what what these pieces of paper said when they picked them up. Yeah, yeah, you know, unbe you know, the funny thing is, like, when all of this fuss is going on in the world, they have no idea, right? They're just trying to get down the river. They they do not know that the newspapers have taken this story and blown it up into like a national emergency. So the Coast Guard is sent out to look for them, and this plane at one point crosses overhead and like drops all of these little leaflets on top of them, and they all they all scatter. Like they're all trying to go find a leaflet. They're all over the place. And, you know, one of them ran, lands right by by Lois and she picks it up and it says, like, we're searching for this party of geologists. Right. They didn't even really know what they were doing down there. They're like, we're looking for this party of geologists. If this is if this is you. They do these gymnastics, right? They give them a series of gymnastics and there's all of these different signals. Like if you need food, do this. If you're all okay, do that. And so they have to go through this series of like kind of jumping jacks to tell the plane that they're they're totally okay. It's going to be all right. <laughs> well, they, they make it to Lee's Ferry. Um, two of the expedition members bail 
and yes. they scramble for a few days to find a couple replacements, which they do. And um, they then continue on down. I mean, so now downriver of Lee's Ferry is the Grand Canyon proper. Right. Um, and so they had that exit point at Lee's Ferry, exit point and kind of a resupplying point. And they'll be able to do it again at Bright Angel mm -hmm. uh, Creek, where now kind of is the, the big you know crossing for hikers and stuff. Right. But that's it. There's not really any other big moments to, to, to get out, I guess. Right. To talk to the outside world. Yeah. Yeah. You write a little bit about how the river uh, breaks people psychologically in a way. Um, I, I'm not implying this is why those two people uh, left the, the expedition, but um, I'm wondering, and so, I mean, let me read one quote here. You write that, um, Clover writes this in her journal. She wrote, you have no idea how difficult it is to keep a mind on mere plants when the river is roaring and the boats are struggling to get through. So now they're into the Grand Canyon proper. Uh, as you read through their journals and may maybe other records they left, can, can you tease out how they're trying to balance this? Like dealing with the, not just the labor of rafting or line, you know, towing these boats down the river, but the psychological stress, and then also trying to find the headspace and the time to do their scientific, uh, you know, collecting of, of things. How, how do they balance this? What do you see them writing about this tension? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in some ways that was the, the biggest challenge and you could see it in the way they wrote their diaries. You know, most, most of this book is based on the diaries and the letters that these two women wrote. And in the beginning, it was just full of plants. They, they were full of excitement for the plants they were going to see, even on the drive out, you know, they were stopping and they were collecting plants. Um, and then as time goes on, right, the diary entries get shorter and shorter and more hurried. And there's just less and less about plants. They're still doing the collecting because there's a separate diary where they're keeping track of the names of the plants that they've collected. But they just they don't have time anymore to really think and write about it. For Alzada in particular, I think that was a huge frustration with this trip. She had big plans. She wanted to hike up little tributaries and kind of go back and do these little nooks and crannies and look for interesting plants. But of course, they're very busy, right? In theory, the boatmen are supposed to be doing the work of getting the boats down the river. But in practice, especially with the lining, all of them have to pitch in and help. And so they're doing a lot of that. They're doing pretty much all of the camp chores, the setting up, the taking down. And they're also doing all of the cooking. There was no discussion about this whatsoever in the letters before the trip. It was just accepted that because they were the women, they would do the cooking. And so they ended up having to trade off. One of them would cook and the other one would go collect plants. And they were doing this very late at night, sometimes after dark. And you have to remember, Elzada Clover's particular interest was cactus. And so not easy plants to collect, right? You would have to like clip a cactus pad, cut it in half, scrape all the pulp out of it, flatten it between pieces of newspaper and then stack that up. It was called a plant press. You'd stack it up with all of your specimens between two pieces of wood. So this wasn't exactly an easy task. So their journals, less and less commentary or discussion about the plants. But we know from the collection that like, the collection of plants doesn't slow down. They keep doing that throughout. They keep doing it. And they um, they prided themselves on actually getting a collection of for, for the cactus, one of every species they saw. And they did a pretty good job with the non-cactus plants as well. So, I mean, it was quite an impressive collection, hundreds and hundreds of specimens. Yeah. I mean, in the end, I think it was like 400 something yeah. uh, different species of plants that they, they catalog and bring specimens home. And some of them are now like part of the national collections, right? Yeah, there's uh, some of these plants are at the Smithsonian. Um, yeah. They're at the University of Michigan. Actually, at, at Herbaria, all over the country have uh, examples of these plants that they collected. And those, it's pretty cool that they save them because um, plants, you know, from kind of historic collections can now be used today with techniques that weren't available at the time. So they're still available for research. Yeah, and they find all kinds of weird things, right? So these are, and this is maybe what drove so much of their curiosity. Like this is an extreme environment in all kinds of ways. So are we going to find plants that are like, how are plants adapting to these extreme environments? And I know the science behind, like, as you said, ecosystems mm -hmm. is not, it's just barely a, an idea. Yeah. Um, but there isn't already ideas about plants adapting to their surroundings, but they right. find parasitic plants, uh, you know, of course, cactus with spines, others that have acid, you know, to deter uh, animals eating them. 
some plants that expel excess salt in liquid filled sacks, <laughs> right. um, zombie plants that go dormant for incredibly long periods, weird ways of spreading seeds. Um, so, and maybe you've kind of already answered this, um, but uh, maybe early, earlier in the trip when they are still writing more, are they in real time making uh, making theories or postulating about like what it is they're seeing that these plants are doing? Or does that all come later after the expedition? For the most part, that that comes later. So they're, you know, they're making these very hasty notes as they go along. Um, her plant diary was quite fascinating because, you know, it would have the scientific name if she knew it, but sometimes she didn't, it, you know, it takes plant identification as a whole thing in itself. And so sometimes there would just be like a dash, like she she didn't exactly know what the plant was. And then she would make some some notes. She would say it was a ragged specimen or we found it in this type of soil or it was on this kind of slope, you know, a couple of little notes, um, often very, you could tell, very hastily done. But then afterwards, you know, Lois and Elzada collaborate on publishing two papers, and they're they're pretty significant papers for anyone who's studying ecology in this region. You know, it not only has a, a list of the species they found, but all kinds of notes about, I assume they were thinking about these things on the trip, but maybe didn't have time to really like formulate their ideas. Um, but all kinds of notes about, you know, how plants interacted with like, um, like mice, you know, mice would try to eat the seeds and they'd stuff them in their cheeks and they would carry them up to the high walls and then not all those seeds would get eaten and some of them would sprout. You know, theories about how are these plants getting into these like really high, strange places or how are they surviving right on the river's edge where these big floods come through and they tear them out and they would talk about how like a cactus pad would get ripped up but then it can reroot. you know, this like single pad would float down river and find a, a place to reroot. One thing that fascinated me was how many exotic species they found. And at the time, you know, they kind of just list these exotic species with the native ones. Like, this one's exotic, you know, without a lot of commentary. Oh, meaning non-Indigenous, like not uh, original to the Grand Canyon. Things right. that have been introduced species. later. Exactly. Species that came from Europe or from Asia yeah. or somewhere else. I, that surprised me because I thought 1938, there, you know, this place that hasn't really been, there's not a lot of hiking or river running yet. Like, how could there be exotic plants or non-native plants? But already, you know, there, you could see that influence of how the ecosystems were were changing. And so really, there are papers that they wrote, fascinating reads. And I know, I, you know, I've interviewed many botanists who work in this region, and they all know those papers. You know, they're still being used today. Yeah, you're right that... Uh... Cotter comes back in 1994, and she, I don't know, what age is she at that point? Um, yeah, she's in her 80s, I want to say, yeah. and she's now married, so her name is Lois Drotter Cutter. Um, yeah, she comes back on a, you know, it's interesting, um, Elzada always wanted to do it a second time, and she never did. Um, she never had that opportunity. Again, this is before commercial trips are, are widely available um, for most of her life. But Lois, um, who's the younger of the two, has a chance to come back and run with a U.S. Geological Survey expedition that's specifically designed to see how the river has changed. Um, one huge change that happened among many is Glen Canyon Dam has gone up. And many people know that Glen Canyon Dam, you know, kind of obliterates Glen Canyon upstream and puts it under Lake Powell. But it also, not as many people know that it makes uh, equally significant changes downriver, right? Downriver from the dam, everything's different now. No big floods, no kind of drought periods where the river gets really low. Um, the water's colder, it's clearer, and that has ripple effects in the ecosystem. So this expedition in the 90s went down to try to understand those effects, and they brought with them a bunch of people they called the old timers, people who had seen the river before the dam went up. And Lois was kind of a special guest on that trip because she she was a scientist and they valued that about her ability to look at this ecosystem with those eyes. And so she, um, I know she just loved the opportunity to go down the river a second time with a science crew and, um, you know, lend her expertise. And really like uh, being included because she had scientific expertise, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, but I mean, I brought that up because... Uh, you you write that she was, I don't know, pleasantly surprised is the word, but these people were coming up to her and she was something of a legend, not just because she was the first, one of the first two women to go down the river, but um, these scientists were saying, oh my goodness, like, you know, those papers that you published and the work you did has been so fun, you know, fundamental to what they were then doing, you know, 60 years later. 
Yeah. Yeah. And the heartbreaking thing is I think Elzada Clover, um, who had passed away by then, never got that recognition during her lifetime. She wrote for decades after the trip of her frustrations with how she was being remembered and how her contributions were being remembered. So I think uh, I think this recognition is long overdue. So as they head down the Grand Canyon, they, you know, they make it to Bright Angel. And they, we have this another set of moments where they're interacting then with the outside world. And uh, again, we see the media more fixated on their gender than than their botany, than the science they were doing. Um, how do we see that kind of play out, the media attention, the, the gendered attention? Yeah, I was um, I was actually shocked, and I, I probably shouldn't have been. I mean, I was expecting going into this book that you know, <laughs> that they had faced sexism. I knew I knew that that was the case. It was very unusual for women of their to get PhDs, let alone in a science field. Um, and it was certainly unusual for them to to go on expeditions like this. So I was I was expecting the sexism, but I well, I wasn't expecting it to be quite so familiar. <laughs> I was I was surprised at how many things that happened to these two women in 1938 are still things that are happening today to women in the sciences and women in outdoor spaces. Um, you know, there's there were big things like, you know, Elzada Clover struggled to get a job and struggled to get a promotion, big stuff like that. But it was really the little stuff that started to get under my skin. You know, the, the media attention, um, journalists would describe their physical appearance like in great detail. And they didn't do that with any of the men, just the women. And that's the sort of thing that Unfortunately, I still see sometimes in, in media attention today. Um, and it, it, I wasn't expecting to write quite as much as I did about the sexism they faced. I wanted the story to be about science, you know, just like Elzada wanted her journey to be about science. But I kept intruding, like I couldn't avoid it. That was their lived experience, right? That they were facing this kind of obsessive attention, kind of unpleasant attention from the press. Yeah, like a film crew makes a short little film about them going through some rapids but again it's it's all about the rapids has mm -hmm. nothing to do with botany uh the mentions of botany and science kind of decrease in the press as the trip goes on uh, one of the ones that i found the most kind of abhorrent is um after the trip they they've now finished and they're in they go into town and some paper runs you know this story with uh, the headline river queens seek beauty because they'd gone into you know get their hair done or something right and like that's the headline is yeah and yeah I mean there were a few things that I had to step away that I couldn't write about right away um I needed to like take a couple of days off to to absorb uh after the river trip you know a, a really well-known um river runner who had done the Grand Canyon writes this really horrible letter to a friend of his Maybe it's not fair to judge based on private letters between two people, but you were know, basically calling Elzada a spinster that had lost her way, like just dismissing her entirely. But he was very interested in Lois. He thought she was quite pretty. And if he was 20 years younger, he would like to date her. You know, and I, you know, it happened 80 years ago and yet it's still talking about it. Just, you know, I had to step away. I couldn't I couldn't write about that for a little while. Because it's still the kind of thing we see happening today with women in the sciences, and that's what I find so frustrating about it. But I should say, on you know, on the flip side, um, there's people like Buzz Holmstrom, who was a joy to write about, because he starts he starts in this book almost as a, a little bit of a villain, right? He's yeah, the one who I thought says, that's where he was going. Yeah, right? he's kind of a jerk. He's kind of a jerk. He's the one who says that women shouldn't be rafting the Grand Canyon. And he's really um, cultivated this persona, maybe not entirely on purpose, but the press has cultivated a persona for him that he's this manly river runner. They would call him things like a he-man's hero, right? <laughs> in the radio <laughs> reports. And here these two women come along and he takes the time to go and meet them and he sort of changes his mind or they change his mind and he becomes really an advocate for them. So, you know, so it's not all bad. There were there were there were some kind of tender and sweet moments too in their interactions with the the men around them. Although I would say that that wasn't the norm. Well, maybe we can zoom out to some of uh, I mean, I we're not we I don't want to spoil like the whole book. People need to go and read it, you know, for all the <laughs> the harrowing details. But um, kind of zooming out, uh, and we kind of already mentioned this a little bit with that trip in 1994 um, of them going back uh, 
of that that expedition of old timers to kind of see how the canyon had changed. Do they offer much commentary? So at the time, uh, uh, Boulder Dam, uh, Hoover Dam, had been just completed, but there's mm -hmm. um, open discussions about Glen Canyon ongoing at the time. Do they comment in their journals during the trip or afterwards um, about the prospect of of damming Glen Canyon? Very little. And that um, somewhat surprised me because the plans were already in the works. Um, there, at least there was plenty of talk already in the works. And interestingly, you know, they didn't have the nice waterproof river guides that we have today. So the maps they were using to find out what's ahead are, were maps made for a dam survey, um, specifically through the Grand Canyon. And on those maps, I went and looked them up. There's these little notches all through this canyon system showing where the, these engineers thought it would be good to place dams. So they must have been aware, right, that this river was was slated to be dammed. Um, what I see in their journals is not really like any kind of sense of apprehension or dread about that, but more of a scientific curiosity. You know, when they reach Lake Mead, the, the reservoir has just started to fill up. It's not yet completely full. And they notice that there's like these waterlogged barrel cacti that are still clinging and their little crowns are sticking up above the water's surface. You know, they wrote down observations like that. And Alzada made a note that she wanted to come back and she wanted to study specifically how the reservoir was affecting the surrounding plant life. And apparently she did that. I found a very brief newspaper article um, talking about her coming back. I think it was a couple of years later to do that study, but I never found it published. And I don't down, know down at Lake Mead, down at Lake Mead. Okay. Yeah. So I I was, you know, I, because she never published that results, I, I don't know what exactly she was able to accomplish. Maybe she wasn't able to get the work done that she wanted to. But I found that interesting that in the 1930s, she had a scientific curiosity about how dams were affecting the ecology. That was a pretty advanced idea at the time. Most people in the 1930s dams were a good idea, right? We need dams for water supply and hydropower and all those things. Nobody was really thinking about how they affected the ecology of the region. Um, and most people who thought about it at all thought it would be a great thing, right? It would be great to have a reservoir in Glen Canyon. Um, I, I, one report talked about how wonderful it would be to have more access to Rainbow Bridge, which at the time was kind of a remote area that you had to hike to off the river, which is something that Elzada and Lois did. Um, and it was like, well, this will be great for tourism. There'll be a reservoir right up to Rainbow Bridge. Now, of course, we think differently about dams. Kind of societal values have changed and more people are concerned about those ecological effects and the tourism effects. So I think they were, I think Elzada specifically was thinking about it, but I don't think, I don't think she really had any idea what, what was ahead, what was going to happen when Glen Canyon Dam went in. There isn't a, you say that they made, did make a note of they're now onto Lake Mead and they're realizing that their map, which is of the Colorado River, is showing rapids that no longer exist, right? Because right. the lake has now filled them up. And there's maybe a moment of sadness, although I don't know if they were that excited about more rapids. It made it easier, but like this acknowledgement that, oh, um, uh, what the river once was, you know, it, it is no longer. It's now under right. 30, 40, whatever feet of water. Yeah, I would try very hard not to project, you know, what we know today onto, I made the decision early on um, in the book, I, my first draft, I was attempting to say more about what was going to happen to the river, not just dams, but exotic species or non-native species, you know, uh, the tourism impacts, all of these things that we know about today. And it didn't work. I got really, really tangled up in that first draft. And so I went back and I eliminated all of the references to anything that happened in the future. And I told myself I'm going to stay in 1938. And I think that really helped because I didn't want to project anything on how Elzada and Lois felt about this. I think people in the 1930s did feel differently about dams than most of us or many of us feel today. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> but they have, I mean, there's an awareness, like they understand that, you know, humans impact their environment. They they see that at Havasupai Gardens, right? Where they're... yeah. They they observed the changes, and I think they did it with with kind of a scientific curiosity and maybe a scientific ob objectivity, right? They could see the changes happening, but like with the the non native species, you know, they wrote them down. They didn't say we're alarmed by this. They just they just noticed it, which is good because now we can use that work as a baseline. You know, there's a concept in ecology called shifting baselines, and it's the idea that we forget how things used to look very quickly, right? And unless we have records of what it was like before, it's easy for us to shift our baselines and assume that this is normal, right? 
So I think their work and also, you know, other, you know, it's not just these papers they wrote. There were others doing work in the region, not botany work, but other kinds of work in the region before Glen Canyon Dam went in. And there's also traditional ecological knowledge from indigenous peoples who lived here. I, I think all of that together helps us kind of pin our baselines in place, helps us remember how things looked and helps us decide like now that we're in this place of, you know, long-term drought and of climate change, what do we want to protect? How do we want to approach that? What do we want to restore? And what are we restoring to? These are all really big questions in ecology that are um, difficult to answer, but makes it a little easier when we have these records of what things used to look like. So in the long term, their botanical, like their scientific work, like it, it has a much broader impact than people might think. Like, oh, it's not just that now we know there were some plants there and here's some old specimens. Um, we can use it to kind of really understand much broader regions and, and impact our decision making uh, today. Because there are so many in public lands, uh, like many competing priorities of, you know, multiple use. I mean, they see this during the trip. They express some frustration when they're up there on the South Rim um, about the National Park Service, who, by the way, was very not excited about people rafting down the river, it sounds like. This was no. not authorized. They hadn't even thought to ask the superintendent. Um, but um, but they expressed some frustration about the, the kind, kind of the singular focus on recreation and tourism in this national park. Uh, and a real neglect of scientific inquiry. Yeah, and I should say, you know, my my threads for this are are slender, um but specifically Lois Jotter was very interested in conservation, which was kind of kind of a newish idea at the time. You know, there was no environmentalism in the 1930s, there was just conservation, and she was she was quite unusual in being very forward thinking about protecting places. She had spent time training to be a National Park Service naturalist. She never actually got that job and it was hard for women to get those jobs. But it, she had ties to the National Park Service and she was aware of or connected to people who were engaged in the 1930s in this really big debate about what the national parks were for. Um, it's written right into the legislation that they're for two things. They're for protecting these places and they're also for tourism. And there was a very clear understanding at the time that those two things do not always go along together. And so I think it was interesting to me to trace the threads of who Lois knew in the Park Service and how she was connected to these debates. Um, her father knew Aldo Leopold, who um, kind of founded environmental ethics, you know, the, this idea of um, protecting the the world for its own sake. Um, and so she had a connection, I think, to, I think she was having lots of discussions at home with her family about these issues in ways that felt to me, you know, kind of surprisingly modern. But it doesn't come out explicitly in the journals. There's not, it does not, a, no. Extensive diatribes where she's no going di on, and on No diatribes, no. Yeah. Later on, I mean, she was a pack rat. She kept everything. And so I have a lot of papers I can work through with her. And, you know, later on, I can kind of, trace her ties to conservation and protection through the letters she wrote and the organizations she donated to. But at the time, remember, she's 24 years old. Um, she's off on a grand adventure and her diary is mostly about rapids. You know, she writes a lot about plants and a lot about rapids and also just about kind of this very extraordinary, unusual experience of camping in these remote places. Well, we're running out of time Maybe it would be appropriate to end with your experience in the canyon, um, and and you actually ha had kind of an artifact from uh, from the Neville's expedition with you. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, should I give that away? I don't know. I'm... <laughs> oh no, maybe not. Oh no, we'll <laughs> maybe make people should... wait to the end. Or tell us about your your experience um, a after having immersed yourself in these records and journals and thinking about these women. What's your headspace as you then go floating down the Colorado River? Right. Yeah. I knew when I got the book contract that I was going to have to to run the Grand Canyon. Um, and I was <laughs> apprehensive about that possibility. I, uh, I'm i not, a, I've never, never done any whitewater river rafting. That was a new experience for me. You know, I camp and I hike and all of that, but I'm really not all that adventurous of a person. So I was pretty nervous. Um, and I, I didn't want to go with a commercial trip because I didn't want to kind of have people feeding me and sitting around and relaxing. I wanted to, to, feel what Elzada and Lewis felt. So I found a botany crew that was going down. Um, their task was to weed an exotic species out of the river corridor. So they were going to be working, a working trip. 
and is this I've Russian on... olive or tamarisk or what's the what are Ravenna they? grass. Oh. Ravenna at, grass. Okay. At the time, I thought you know Ravenna grass that sounds much better than tamarisk, but I didn't know at the time that I you know like I think grass like little little sprigs of grass. I didn't know at the time that Ravenna grass is like it grows to be like the size of a haystack, and we found some that were like haystack sized clumps of grass that took hours and hours to dig out. So I didn't really know what I was getting into, which was okay because. Elzada and Lois didn't know what they were getting into either. And so I think I was able to channel some of their feelings. You know, Lois in particular really took seriously the possibility that she could die on this trip. Um, she, you know, the letters she wrote before the trip, it was clear that she wanted to go and she was going to make it happen, but she, she knew that that was a possibility she could drown on the river. And so it was good that I was nervous because I could channel some of what she must have been feeling. And I was very safe. I was with a very experienced crew and um, it was, it was a wonderful trip. And uh, you know, it's hard to describe what it's like to see the Grand Canyon from that perspective, from the perspective of the river. It's nothing like the experience of hiking. It's quite a different experience. Just having the river kind of funnel down into this otherworldly place and the rest of the world falls away. You forget that it, it exists, you know? And the only thing that feels real is the rocks and the sunlight and the water. I don't know. It was incredible. Um, was this after you had the book manuscript finished or was it still in process? My goal was to have the manuscript finished, um, but I didn't quite make it. So I didn't have the final chapter in the epilogue done. I had been struggling to write them. Um, I, I wasn't quite sure yet. I think what I, what, I thought I knew what I wanted to say, but it wasn't working. And I actually wrote the epilogue on that river trip. There was a day when this rainstorm settled in and we were all trapped in our tent for, for several hours and we couldn't leave. And I pulled out a scrap piece of paper and I wrote the epilogue while I was in that tent. And it didn't turn out what I thought I was going to say. <laughs> it's not where I thought the book was going. Um, but I think that was the right place to have all of my ideas crystallize. Did it lead you to any other broader revisions on the existing manuscript after like yeah. as you're going back through final revisions, can you can you kind of see the fingerprints of your river experience on how you revised? Yeah, yeah. I kept a, a detailed diary on that trip, and when I got home, I I read it and I typed up little bits of description that I thought I could use. And I had I had gone into it knowing that there were certain places that I didn't yet know how to describe. You know, I had the diaries, but they didn't often really dive into a deep description. They would say, "Well, we came up on Tanner Rapid and we we saw the Desert View Watchtower." But that's not much to go on. And you know, just googling around for photos can only get you so far. So I made notes on my little waterproof river guide, like stop here and look look up, look at this thing. And then when I got back, I typed up those little bits of description and I actually printed out my draft and I physically taped these little pieces into my draft. And when I was revising, I tried to kind of work them in. Oh, that's great. Well, um, the book was delightful. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, congrats on, on getting it out. It's a, it's an accomplishment. Thank you so much. I'm I'm so excited to bring this story to more people. I think it's been overlooked for far too long. And it really was just a joy to write about these two women. Uh, they were a lot of fun. I'm, I'm kind of sad to sort of let them go. <laughs> we look forward to uh, books you do in the future, your ongoing kind of science writing and journalism at KNAU and you know, wherever else you end up doing stuff. And um, I'll make sure to, um, to drop a line. I'm in Flagstaff semi-regularly so um, great be great to meet in person as well but um, thank you wonderful. for spending a little time with with me melissa this has been great thanks so much i appreciate it all right take care all right bye thank you so much for listening i hope you'll subscribe and listen every month please leave us a review on whatever app or platform you're listening through or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates and leave comments. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Rudd Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. We're an interdisciplinary research center that supports academic research and the promotion of public understandings about the North American West. We host regular public lectures, which we live stream, have an annual funding cycle with award, grant, and fellowship categories that nearly anyone researching or working on the region from any disciplinary approach or towards any final product can apply. Learn more at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D -D center. 
Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Dahl, Anderson, with an O, dot com. I'll put a link in the episode description. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, and just about everything else, so you can direct any praise or critique my way. I'm author and editor of a number of books on the West, borderlands, Native peoples, genocide studies, religion, and the environment. Recently, my book, Native But Foreign, Indigenous Immigrants and Refugees in the North American Borderlands, published by Texas A&M University Press in 2018, won the Best Historical Nonfiction Book Award from the Western Writers of America. In an anthology I co-edited with P. Jane Hafen, entitled Essays on American Indian and Mormon History, published by the University of Utah Press in 2019, won the Metcalf Best Anthology Book Prize from the John Whitmer Historical Association. Here at the Red Center, I'm also general editor and project manager of a great digital history, uh, public history project named Intermountain Histories. It's a free mobile app and website, uh, intermountainhistories.org, that curates student-researched and written micro-histories of the region, complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. To contact me about the podcast, my own research, or anything else, head to bwrensink, that's R-E-N-S-I-N-K, dot org, or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. Until next month, be well, be curious, and be kind. Cheers. Cheers.